Evening and welcome to Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, PBDC TV's horror movie review program that, yes, is hosted by a talking cat. It's a new season here at Spooky Tales, our fourth season in fact. But our mission has not changed. Last season we journeyed back to the VHS era of the 1980s, and we're going back there for this week as well. Tonight we're going to talk about a VHS era classic that you may have missed, but is worth checking out. Um. Gwen, could you please put the collar on hold so we can finish the opener? Thanks. Uh, so, like I said, tonight's film is one you may not remember, but it's worth watching and features special effects by the legendary Tom Savini. Gwen, for crying out loud, we are trying to do a show here. Steve, you need to take this call. It's important. Ugh, fine. Put it on screen. Good evening, this is Steve. How can I help you? Hey! Hey, kitty cat! We've got your monkey! I'm, I'm sorry, what? I said, we've got your monkey. That little feller what talks about the aliens and such. Your monkey. We caught him. Steve, they're crazy. Get me out of here. Don't you judge us. Don't you be judging us. You come into our woods with your book learning and your hygiene, and, and you want to look down on us while you're not better than us. Okay, everyone, hold on. Let's back up a minute. Now, who are you? And why do you have Meerkat in a cage? The name's Bartholomew Edward Lamb, but you can call me Ed. And this is my sister, Darlin'. And your monkey was trespassing in our woods. Trespassing? I was following a deer path. And out of nowhere, some furry purple monster attacked me. Then I woke up with these people. You see? Trespassing. And let me guess. Now you're going to eat him. Eat him? Oh, Lord, no. I'm going to f*** him. Woo-wee! I've always wanted to f*** me a monkey. You're going to what? No, baby, no! You promised you were going to stop doing that. We're keeping him for Precious, remember? Oh, oh, that, that's, that's right. We're going to marry him to Precious. It's time that our baby girl settled down and got a husband. But, hang on, hold the phone. Did you just say our baby girl? Didn't you say she's your sister? Don't you judge us! Don't you be judging us! You come in here with your book learning and your acceptable social conventions and, and your need to impose arbitrary cultural taboos and you look down on simple folks like us. You're not better than us. Oh dear God, please get me away from these people. That's no way to talk about your kin. My daughter niece is a beautiful woman. You're lucky that she'll have you. Take a look. <laughs> She's a little bit unwell, so sometimes we have to lock her in the basement for a spell. I'm betting she's not the only thing you've got locked up down there. Oh, brother, you've got that right. Don't you judge us! Don't you look down on us with your, your fancy book learning and your preconceived notions and your subtle implications that all simple folk traffic in the manufacture and distribution of homebrewed pharmaceuticals? Don't you disparage us with your subtle innuendos? That's right. Plus, anyone worth his salt knows that you never put the meth lab in the basement because you can blow up the entire house. We keep it all proper in the shed out back, like professionals. I don't write the dialogue, folks. Send all your complaints to the showrunner. Don't you break the fourth wall! Don't you ever be breaking the fourth wall! You come in here with your fancy learning and your self-referential humor and your show-within-a-show-metal references and you just destroy our simple yet finely crafted narrative. Don't you be breaking the fourth wall! 
Listen, um, Ed and uh, um, Darlin, I think we got off on the wrong foot here. This is all a misunderstanding. Meerkat is not there to hurt you. He doesn't work for the state liquor board. He doesn't work for the ATF or the DEA. He's actually up in the mountains on a rescue mission. He's looking for our friend, the little red dinosaur named Malcolm Fluffosaurus. Fluffosaurus? Is he the one we saw on the TV? The one what sings about them songs about the feller in the loincloth? The one doing his chores? You mean he's here? Yes, yeah, exactly. The song's about Hercules. I, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the loincloth guy. Anyway, Malcolm was last seen somewhere in the woods near your home, and we're concerned that he may be in danger. Meerkat's not there to hurt anybody, and he's not there to cause any trouble. He's there to find Malcolm and bring him home. Brother husband, do you know what this means? I sure do, sister wife. I'm gonna f*** me a dinosaur. Woo-wee! I've always wanted to f*** a dinosaur. That's even better than a bookie. No, Ed, no! It's for Precious. We can marry him to Precious. He's a celebrity. They'll all talk about the wedding in that People magazine, what they sell down at the Piggly Wiggly. Precious! Oh, Precious, sweetie! What do you think? Do you want to marry that singing dinosaur? Yes, darling. Yes, she's positively radiant. And that means I get to f*** that monkey. I, I, I mean, eat, eat, eat that monkey. We could serve him at the wedding reception. Woo, doggy! We found Precious, a husband, and a buffet all at the same time. Steve, I am begging you. Please get me out of here. I don't want to be a wedding buffet. And I think I might be getting a contact buzz from all the crystal meth floating around in the air. Now, monkey, don't you give me no trouble now. If my daughter niece wants a monkey wedding buffet, then she gets a monkey wedding buffet. Hey, kitty cat, I was calling because I wanted to invite you all to the wedding, seeing how as we're going to be kin and all. But now it might be a bit awkward, what with us eating your monkey friend instead of bringing him into the family. Plus, I think a bunch of strange guests might just be too much for Precious. She's delicate, you know, on account of being a little bit unwell. Good talking to you, though, and good luck with them stories what you make for the television. Adios. Uh, okay, Gwen fancies up to his neck with the quarterly budget review, so I need you to get to the airfield, hop a C-130 to West Virginia, and rescue Meerkat from the Beverly Meth Billies. He's annoying, but if we don't keep him around to use as a scapegoat, Malcolm's mother is eventually going to come after one of us in her lawsuit. Aye, aye, Steve. Operation Monkey Freedom is underway. Well, that was... Interesting, but now it's time to get down to the business of horror movies. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad you're here. Now here we go. Hustle your gals over to the refreshment table and dig in. <laughs> Boy. Boy? Hurry up. All right, let's get into our featured film review. We are going to talk about this film called The Prowler. The Prowler is a horror slasher film of the whodunit variety. It was released in the year 1981, so one of the early films in the uh, VHS slasher uh, golden age. Uh, directed by Joseph Zito, and probably more importantly for a lot of you, special effects by Tom Savini. Um, some of Tom Savini's... I don't know if you'd say early work, but some of his early 80s work, uh, which uh, is actually very good in this film. And the cast includes Vicki Dawson, Farley Granger, Lawrence Tierney, and an assortment of others that you probably have not heard of either. 
Let's get into setting your expectations for this film. We know, of course, that setting your expectations is very important when it comes to reviewing films, because if you expect one thing and see something else, for example, you expect a comedy and you see a serious drama, um, not only uh, are you not necessarily going to enjoy the film, you're not going to be able to give an objective assessment of the film because um, you've been biased by your uh, disappointment and your uh, unmet expectations. So, if you are going to watch The Prowler, what you should expect is a pretty well-executed but otherwise conventional 1980s-era slasher film with very good practical special effects from Tom Savini. Now, if you like Friday the 13th, you uh, will probably like The Prowler. If you like Halloween, you'll probably probably like The Prowler. Uh, any 80s-era slasher who done it, you'll probably like The Prowler. Um, and not necessarily 80s, uh, late 70s as well. Uh, Black Christmas, um, just as well. Uh, any kind of slasher who done it, um, pieces, any of those other films from the era. So let's get into calibrating our expectations. This is the scale we use on the show. On this chart, on the far left side, we have very campy films such as Jason X. On the far right side, we have very serious films such as The Silence of the Lambs. This scale is not an assessment of the quality of the film. This scale is an indicator of what your mindset needs to be going into the film if you're going to maximize your enjoyment. The Prowler was kind of a mainstream horror release, so it's pretty much right down the middle. It's not completely campy, but it's not a particularly serious film either. It's more of a summer popcorn kind of horror film. Before we go any farther, of course, we have to have our vocabulary lesson. This is the part of the show where we discuss new and innovative words and phrases in an effort to stay ahead of social media bots and algorithms that would otherwise try to ban our conversation. The algorithms are always learning to recognize new phrases, so we have to stay ahead of them. They're always evolving, so our language must evolve faster. Our first term is double stacking. Double stacking is a noun that refers to the action in a horror movie of impaling both members of a canoodling couple in one single thrust. Colloquial forms of this include making a double stacker, making a double decker, and hitting the daily double. Our second term is bayonet coronation. Again, this is a noun, and uh, this term refers to the action in a horror movie of driving a knife through the top of another character's noggin. Yes, we say noggin on this show. It's one of those terms we use to avoid being banned. Um, it's not the kind of word that uh, social media bots tend to look for. So anyway, those are your vocabulary lesson words for today. Please keep these words in mind. They will become important later in the episode. Let's get into a summary of this film. So uh, in 1944, a young woman named Rosemary sends a Dear John letter to an unnamed boyfriend who is away at war. And as we know, war causes a lot of problems. They didn't have white onions because of the war. The only thing you could get was those big yellow ones. Yes, thank you, Grandpa Simpson. Uh, so a year later, she is attending a college graduation dance with her new boyfriend. She and her new boyfriend sneak off to be alone in the gazebo, and they are both murdered. Uh, we kind of got a hint of that in the uh, clip before the uh, featured film review started. Um, we didn't show the, uh, the, the juiciest part, but uh, you probably got the impression that it wasn't going to end well for them, and you would not be wrong. Anyway, fast forward to 1980, where a group of college seniors are putting together a graduation dance at the same school. The first since the murders, and of course the old timers in town are all, oh, you can't have one of these dances, not after what happened. Uh, it's kind of silly when you think about it in modern context, but a lot of people are concerned that uh, for some reason having another dance, um, you know, 40 years later is going to somehow cause the same thing to happen. And interestingly enough, what are the odds that a copycat killer will stalk this dance? Or, more to the point, is it the same killer from 1945? This of course leads us to our villain profile. The villain for this film is this guy right here. Well, we assume it's a guy, but we don't really know because we can't see the face. 
The name of this uh, villain is The Prowler, and they actually refer to the killer as The Prowler in this film. Um, the Prowler is of the slasher serial killer class, not a super-powered slasher serial killer. This is from the early part of the 1980s, and it's a whodunit. Uh, in early 80s whodunits, the killers tended to be just uh, highly motivated or uh, demented people. They didn't really necessarily have any kind of superpowers. Uh, as films went on and on, you got Jason Voorhees and uh, super-powered Michael Myers and uh, Freddy Krueger and everything else, and uh, those films were kind of different, but the whodunit variety, um, the, uh, the dramatic tension came from not knowing who the killer is, not from people battling against an unstoppable killing machine. Anyway, the Prowler's special powers are stealth and proficiency with a bayonet, otherwise does not really have any superpowers, as we said, it's just a highly motivated human being. And the Prowler's signature weapon is, well, the Prowler employs multiple weapons. They include, but are not limited to, a bayonet and, strangely, a pitchfork. And now a word from our benevolent overlords at PBDC-TV, your nightly heartbeat of horror. Hello, all you beautiful people! It's your boy, Flippy! <laughs> And I'm not gouging my face down in gallons and gallons of ice cream. I'm watching PBDC TV. Yes, yes, the most amazing TV show out there. Now keep on watching. I love y'all. Mwah! Stay nasty. Well, gentlemen, perhaps we wouldn't be where we are today if we hadn't said to ourselves, just go, 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 go for it. This final score for this film, we're going to give it three paws out of four. La Señora de la Santa Muerte, Spanish for Our Lady of the Holy Dead. Out now! Ooh, nice sex and violence! Hi everybody, I'm a cop. And I'm Free Sex with Diamon. And we are Roots Bleed Red on Psycho Bunny Death Cult. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> In fact, humans have a very long history of eating each other. So lock your doors, turn out your lights, and join us for Cooler Radio.
This is Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus from Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, and when I'm not hosting Monster Chat or knocking down small Japanese cities, I'm watching PBDC TV. Now back to the show. So let's talk about some of the things I liked about this film. First off, it is very well directed. It is much better executed than the typical 1980s slasher film. I really started to appreciate that as I was putting those clips together but that you saw right before the film review started. Um, taking clips out of this film, I, I got an appreciation for all the different camera angles and all the different edits and it just uh, it struck me that this was a really tight package, a really well put together film. The practical special effects are very good uh, considering the era and considering the film's budget. And as we've mentioned, the special effects are by Tom Savini. That alone is probably a good reason to watch this one if you have not seen it already. Uh, it is a slasher film, but it is not a splatter film. It relies heavily on tension, suspense, and jump scares. So the flavor of this film is more Halloween than Friday the 13th now. Caveat with that, the original Halloween had little, if any, blood and gore and violence. Uh, well, not necessarily violence, but it had very little blood and gore. Uh, this film does have some blood and gore from the master Tom Savini, so in that respect it is different from Halloween, but the feel of the film, uh, tension, jump scares, uh, ambush predators sneaking out of the shadows, um, more Halloween than uh, Friday the 13th where Jason's just kind of coming at you like a tank. The lead actress in this film, Vicki Dawson, is likable and she does a respectable acting job. Uh, compared to the other people in the film, she is very, very good. Of course, it is an 80s slasher film. It is not without flaw. Let's talk about some of the things that could have been better. Now, these are not necessarily things I had a problem with, but uh, to give a fair review, these are things that a viewer of the film might have a problem with. So, for starters, the pacing of the film is too slow, particularly in the middle, and I'm sorry, there's no way around this. The middle of the film just is too slow, goes on for too long, there's just too much skulking around looking for clues. Um, it's really the one thing that kept me from giving an even higher score to this film, and I did like this film, and I do recommend it, but I would have given it an even higher score um, had it been a little quicker in the middle act. It tries a little too hard to set up tension and to set up jump scares. The high tension scenes, because of that, end up going on for too long, and they just slow down the film. So they're attempting to build a lot of tension, but in reality, they're just slowing down the film. Uh, frankly, it needs a couple of more kills and less creeping around looking for clues. Now, that might have been a budgetary thing. It might have been they decided, okay, we've got Tom Savini. Let's go with a smaller number of very high-quality special effect kills. Um, I can't speak to that, but um, speaking purely as a fan, uh, considering the pacing of the film, it needed a couple of more kills in the middle to really even it out. Now, apart from Vicki Dawson, the acting is mediocre. It is no better, nor is it any worse than what you would see in any other slasher film from the era. So from that perspective, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not bad, uh, graded on the curve against the other films uh, in its uh, peer group. Um, it's kind of mediocre compared to modern dramas, though. And uh, finally, the film is formulaic. Lots of slasher films are formulaic, let's be honest. And uh, for whatever reason, it is not particularly memorable. It does not have some real memorable moments that just reach out and grab you and that will come back to mind you know, days and weeks later. So I was, as I was watching this film, I was thinking, this film is very good. I don't know why I didn't watch this back in the 80s. As, and as it went along, it occurred to me that, you know, I probably did see this one back in the 80s and I just don't remember any of it just because... Even though it's well executed, even though it has good special effects, for some reason it's like the stereotype about Chinese food that uh, an hour later you don't remember what you've watched. Um, it's just, it doesn't stick to your brain. So let's get to Steve's scorecard for this film. Kills, I counted eight. Bare breasts, I counted two. You kind of got a hint of that in the clip before the fe featured film review started. Denogginings. There is one, and it is uh, performed via shotgun, so it's not a bladed weapon, it is a shotgun used to remove someone's cranium. Pez dispensarings, there is one employing a bayonet. 
Fondoings. Not one, not two. There are three fondoings. Just three different instances of somebody being skewered on the end of a long fork. Double stackings. It's a vocabulary lesson word, so you figure there's going to be at least one in the film. You would not be wrong. There is one in the film. Bayonet coronations. Again, I counted one. And that is all for the scorecard, but let's get into the voluminous bonus features that you get with this film. So for starters, you get a man that tries to impress his girlfriend by saying, my daddy's got even more money than he does. Um, pro tip people, if you are a college age man trying to impress your college age girlfriend, uh, be advised that um, some college age women are not above going after older men and older men are definitely not above going after college age women. Telling your girlfriend or your, your potential girlfriend that your dad's the one with all the money, probably not the smartest move. Uh, you get 1980s short shorts action. We've talked about this in some other film reviews. This is 1981, so uh, it's kind of the tail end of 1970s culture before you get into 1980s culture. So uh, I think as we've said before, this film is less parachute pants and high top fades and more short shorts and roller skates. There's no roller skates in this film in particular, uh, but you do have lots of short shorts. You get a band that sounds vaguely like Boston, and no, I do not mean the city of Boston, I mean the band Boston. Uh, Boston's debut album in 1977 was like the biggest thing ever. Uh, 1980, their second album would have come out, and it's just, uh, it's a sound that is very familiar to those of us from the era. And not just from Boston, there were other bands that had a similar sound, LaRue, and so on and so forth. You get shower stabbing action. And along with the shower stabbing action, you get a head scratcher. Seriously, nobody heard the screaming girl being stabbed to death in the shower? It uh, kind of defies belief. Here, let's take a look at this. You see what I mean? Apparently nobody in the dormitory heard that. It's just weird. I, I guess the assumption is that everybody was downstairs at the dance and they couldn't hear over the music. Um, I'm sure they could come up with a plausible explanation, but it was kind of a head-scratcher. Uh, you get a super diligent police deputy who searches the dormitory and completely overlooks two dead bodies. Now, of course, it is ridiculous to think that in real life a small-town sheriff's deputy would do such a thing. It's not like we've ever seen 400 armed policemen stand outside an elementary school while a gunman shot and killed elementary school-aged children because they were afraid to go in like, because they were afraid they might get hurt. Um, so yeah, then again, I can find this entirely believable. Uh, you get someone who's making a lot of noise considering she just got stabbed in the throat. And I know actors and actresses put a lot of effort into their craft, uh, particularly with death scenes, put a lot of effort into them. And sometimes physics be damned, biology be damned, anatomy be damned. I'm going to act out this death scene the way I've rehearsed it, regardless of whether it is scientifically plausible considering the types of injuries I have suffered. You get cemetery party action. You get open grave action. You get corpse hidden in the chimney action. Seems like I need a vocabulary lesson for that one. We'll try to come up with that at some other time. And finally, always empty the magazine. Folks, if the killer is on the ground and you think maybe you've killed him with a gunshot, empty the magazine and make sure. In fact, empty the magazine into the killer's head and make sure. If you're wrong and the killer was already dead, all you've done is put some extra holes in a dead body. You've not hurt anybody. If you make a mistake and assume the killer's dead and the killer is not, now you've put yourself and your associates in danger. Finally, there is one more that I forgot about. We have corpse attack action. For some reason, a lot of these 80s slasher films, especially early on, threw in some sort of a bit with a dead body uh, uh, coming apparently back to life and attacking people at some point. You get one of those in this film. There was one at the end of Pieces as well. So uh, this, um, again, reminiscent of the film Pieces. So let's get to Steve's final score for this film. I'm going to give it two and a half paws out of four. I wanted to give it three. But the problem is, it's just a little too slow in the middle. This film is very well directed, it is very well executed, and it's a slasher film of the early 80s that features good practical special effects from Tom Savini. 
unfortunately is formulaic, it's not memorable, and it is hampered by slow pacing. So I do recommend this one. If you're a fan of 80s slasher films, you will enjoy this one. Uh, if you're like me, you may have seen this one but not really remember it very well. It is worth going back and watching. Uh, I do recommend this one. I wish I could have given it a higher score, but uh, I think if when you watch it, you'll probably agree with me that the middle of the film, just a little too slow, a little too much skulking around and looking for clues and not enough, um, not enough kills and not enough action. But two and a half paws out of four, recommendation from Steve the Cat. That is The Prowler, and that is our featured film review. We spent a lot of time staring at this one little spot. Do you know why you're here? Girl talk? Are you seeing anybody? Not really. <sighs> you are boring me. You, don't move. You, get away from the window, now! I don't want to hurt anybody. Get on the floor. Yeah, and uh, beautiful dames are always coming to me under false pretenses. Cold-blooded killer, that's all I see. We've come to the end of yet another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. But before we go, as is our tradition, we're going to take just a moment to talk about some other stuff I watched last week. This week we're going to talk about this film called Poor Agnes. I found this film free with ads on Tubi. Uh, I imagine it is available on other streaming services as well. It is a 2017 serial killer film, a Canadian film if I uh, remember correctly. And in this film, Agnes is a beautiful woman living in a remote location. She is contacted by Mike, a CNN reporter doing a story about a man who has disappeared. Now this is no problem except for the fact that Agnes is a serial killer and she is the person who killed the man who is missing. So eventually Mike ends up becoming Agnes's prisoner and she begins the process of first breaking him and then training him once the Stockholm Syndrome starts to take hold. So what do we think of this film? Well, I definitely recommend this film. It is well acted, it has a very interesting story. It's a little tough to watch because of Agnes's uh, efforts to break Mike's spirit. It's not as tough to watch as the Poughkeepsie tapes, but uh, tough for the same kind of reason, that it's uh, physical and psychological torture that you're uh, forced to watch somebody endure. Now, this film is more on the drama end of the spectrum and less on the slasher end of the spectrum. This is more of a true crime film than a splatter fest. Uh, it's more psychological than kinetic action. Uh, so avoid this film if you're looking for a popcorn movie. If you just need something with a high kill count and uh, doesn't take itself too seriously, this is not the film for you. However, definitely watch this film if you want an intelligent, dark, and psychological film. So that is Poor Agnes. I recommend this film. You can find it free with ads on Tubi. And that is the other stuff I watched this week. That brings us to the end of another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Thank you so much for joining us. We had a lot of fun putting this episode together and we hope you enjoyed it. Of course, we always love to hear from you, so feel free to sound off in the comments about The Prowler or your favorite whodunit type slasher movie or anything else that suits your fancy. And as always, if you did enjoy the show, please give us a like and a share. The best thing you can do to help us out is to share this video and it costs you absolutely nothing to share it out. If you want to stay up to speed on our latest videos and other goings-on, you can follow us and subscribe on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Rumble, and Facebook. Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat is available exclusively through PBDC-TV, your nightly heartbeat of horror. If you're interested in horror movies, true crime, creepy history, or unexplained events, we're sure to have a show for you. You can find us at PsychoBunnyDC.com, and we're also on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and Rumble. And we also have a 100% Zuckerberg-free Discord site. If you would like to check it out, just head on over to PsychoBunnyDC and click the link for an invitation. Next week, we'll leave the VHS era behind and talk about something a bit more recent. Something that happens to be very, very silly. In the meantime, everyone have a great week and stay safe. We'll see you again soon. Good night, everybody.